High Speed Rail is a little bit too much of a religious kind of project. I'm using that in the loosest possible sense in that there's people who are devotees of it because they love the idea, the conception. Wendell, thanks, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Adrian Moore. I'm Vice President of the Reason Foundation. With me is Wendell Cox, who's a principal at Demographia. He's a, a consultant who's worked on transportation issues for how many years? Oh, Do we even want to say? More long years than, say. than I would have long enough. Long enough to have seen, uh, seen a lot of bodies get buried. <laughs> and uh, Wendell has worked with us at Reason uh, for, I don't know, it's been a good five years or so since we started uh, working on the high-speed right. rail yeah. uh, project here in California, analyzing what's being proposed and what crosswalking that against what seems to be reality and uh, trying to separate the hopes and the dreams from some of the cold, hard facts. Uh, we did, uh, you and your, uh, your partner in crime, Joe Vranich, uh, right. uh, did a study for us in 2009? 2008. Just 2008 right, right. was the first uh, study that was a very detailed analysis of the plan as it existed then. Uh, the, the, the state of California, the High Speed Rail Authority, has updated that plan since. Uh, so last year, you and Joe uh, collaborated on another analysis of that update. Uh, and found uh, uh, there was a lot of, the changes were a lot of sound and fury, but the, the, the crosswalk with reality hadn't really improved very much. So we'll get into a little of that, but before, uh, before we talk about some of the things that, that you guys have identified as being wrong with this project, I, I thought there's, there's some interesting stories around this thing. Anytime you're talking about building something as massive as a high-speed train line between Los Angeles and San Francisco, or I guess, you know, big picture, bringing in San Diego, Sacramento, and, and everything in between, uh, a lot happens along the way. And one of the things, the latest things that has happened is uh, a, there's been a series of lawsuits. Now, most of those lawsuits have been settled, uh, but one that Wendell and I are both expert witnesses in uh, very specifically charges that when the High Speed Rail Authority in 2008 came to the voters of California and asked for 10.9 billion dollars to fund uh, the high-speed rail system. They, the law that was the ballot measure that California voters approved made a lot of very specific promises. It said things like when it will be built, how fast it'll go, uh, where it will be built, how much they would charge. So there was a lot of very specific promises that they thought they needed in order to get voters to vote yes. Voters did vote yes. The current plan now, five years later, violates every single one of those promises. <laughs> and so the lawsuit says, you know, really you can't spend that $10 billion if the law that authorizes you to spend the $10 billion has promises that you have not kept. I mean, that's kind of a contract with the voters. So we each uh, tackled parts of that in our, uh, our, our expert testimony. Uh, and we'll see where that case goes. These things drag on forever. They really just got started in May. So it's a relatively uh, recent uh, uh, case in terms of getting in front of the courts. The one other thing I want to share about that that I think is the most interesting is a fellow named Quentin Coop, used to be a state senator for California, Used to be a uh, a state judge. Uh, uh, was it Supreme Court? Not sure. No, Superior not Court judge. Superior maybe. Court, yeah. uh, but he was a, a senior judge. He was one of the first chairmen of the California High Speed Rail Authority. So he's the one who really was in charge when the initial idea got off the ground and in preparation for getting that vote for that initial ten billion dollars. And during that election, I debated him up and down the state, and he was a vehement vehement fanatical supporter of this high-speed rail project and I was a critic <laughs> and so we butted heads a lot. Well he has now joined that lawsuit as an expert witness explaining just how awful and bad the current plan is. So here's the most maybe the most prominent high-speed rail advocate in the state of California who is now part of a lawsuit suing to stop it because the plan is so bad. He doesn't he's not against high-speed rail he's against this plan and that's a distinction I think uh, a lot of people, a lot of people don't make. Uh, Wendell's partner Joe Vranich uh, was back in the day. <laughs> it was some time ago, but he used to be head of. He was a director of the of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association. He's a high speed rail 
fan and booster. He just doesn't like this plan. He doesn't think this is going to work. So that's really the crux of what I want to spend a little more time talking about is why is this plan so bad and why is this thing not going to work? Uh, you know, why isn't a high-speed train between Los Angeles and San Francisco just a cracking good idea? Um, so let's just start with sort of a kind of a big, maybe a big picture. I mean, Wendell, what do you, when, you, when you think about the, the plan for this project and what you know about high-speed rail as it actually exists in the world, in China and Taiwan and Japan and in Western Europe, uh, you know, what's the disconnect here? What's the fundamental difference about the California plan that, that uh, stands out? Well, I think, first of all, let's step back to Senator Quentin Kopp. Um, here, the leading exponent of, uh, of high-speed rail in California. He's a guy that's very well respected, uh, and a guy all of us would love to debate, but he's, he's, he's a, a very highly respected guy. And he's telling us he's against this thing now, and the very basic reason he's against it is it's not high-speed rail anymore. Quentin Kopp is a fan of high-speed rail. Uh, the legislature uh, promised uh, the voters in, in, the, uh, in the referendum that you uh, mentioned that this train would go, 200 and, uh, would go from Los Angeles to San Francisco in two hours and 40 minutes. Can't be done. There is no way. In fact, Joe and I in, in 2008 said it couldn't be done even then. It, what's happened is they have scaled back the program from a real high-speed rail program, and there are problems with those, to what they call a blended system, where somehow we're going to run concurrently with the, Penn, with the uh, Caltrain commuter rail program into San Jose from Transbay in San Francisco, and when we get to Palmdale, we're going to get on the Metrolink tracks. Well, you know, uh, it's, it's just not going to work. And, and that's why Senator Kopp uh, was, was, is against it now. Uh, but the, the thing that really concerns me here, and I've been bothered about this for a long time on a number of projects, is that if Sam Walton uh, had made this promise to his, uh, to his customers, he would have finished his, his days in jail. <laughs> um, the, the fact is that uh, uh, we had in 2000, the High Speed Rail Authority said, we will build you this system. It'll cost $22 billion from Los Angeles to San Francisco. And before they scaled it back, it had reached $80 billion. And this is typical of what happens on these things. You can't, you can't trust it. And just very quickly, to end this, this segment, uh, we worked with Reason three years ago, two years ago, looking at the Florida High Speed Rail program. And we made the same arguments and showed all over the place that the, the, the way the cost escalation had gone and how the record of high-speed rail is to make promises to governments and voters it can't keep. And to his credit, Governor Scott of Florida canceled the system. Yeah, nobody's quite had the, the uh, wherewithal to do that in California. No. Yeah, it, 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 it is kind of shocking how they, the, 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 the yo-yo that this, uh, this project has been on. So they came out with a, you know, Something at a price tag, you know, like say $22 billion that people say, wow, that's a lot of money, but you can kind of imagine, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to build that big train. And then, uh, you know, a few years later when they have to be a little more realistic and they actually have to put a business plan together, it goes up to $80 billion. There's so much shock and outrage over that. It, was, it couldn't have been three weeks later they came out and said, no, 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 okay, it'll only be 60 million. <laughs> well, first of all, only 60 billion. Oh, only three times what we originally said. But then the fact that they could just chop 20 billion tells you they were making up the numbers in the first place. You can't just chop 25% off of the price unless you were faking the numbers in the first place. And, and to get that, they came up with this blended system. Now, for those of you not you know, immersed in California uh, uh, geography, essentially what they're saying is, well, we're going to do a, a normal speed train, so to speak, maybe a slightly faster than average train from downtown LA all the way out to the Central Valley of California, or at least to the desert. And then once we get to San Jose, we're going to slow down to normal train speeds all the way into San Francisco. So it's only going to be super fast, allegedly 220 miles an hour, between San Jose and Palmdale Lancaster at best. So. In order to reach the time, the, to meet that two hour and 40 minutes, if they actually went slow on those two bookends, it would train would probably have to go more like 280 <laughs> through the Central Valley, technically not possible with current technology. So there's, the whole thing's just a loser. There's, it's, the two hour and 40 minutes was put, requirement was put in there by the legislature because they realized if this thing was not 
somewhat competitive with flying in terms of time, people weren't going to use it. And once you start getting up to a three and a half hour train ride versus a 45 minute flight, uh, even with the extra TSA time on the front end uh, of, of the flight, and assuming there's no TSA at the, air, at the high speed train, which is a big assumption, um, it's still a, a losing proposition. So, so they, they keep monkeying with this thing. Is I think maybe our yeah. biggest beef is that they're not serious about a plan that really will work and then trying to go to the, to the people of California and say, okay, look, realistically, this is what it takes to build a high-speed train. Are we going to get behind that? And they know that that won't fly, so they keep trying to well, you go back around with it. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, Senator Cop was not the first resignation, or was not the first person who was on board to jump off the train. One of the most respected leaders in the history, or the recent history of California, Senator Jim Mills of San Diego. Senator Mills is father of the highly regarded light rail program in San Diego. Senator Mills was on the high speed rail board. And he resigned. And when he resigned, he said the reason he was resigning is because he didn't under, he didn't uh, didn't trust what he was being being given by the staff and by the consultants, and for good reason. I mean, the 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 number of things. Uh, for example, the very idea that these guys still claim they can make two hours and forty minutes. Now, the neat thing is for them, of course, when and if this thing is ever built and it comes in at three fifty, which Joe and I think is the fastest it can run, nobody's going to jail. Uh, so, what does the law mean? But but the, the basic point is that uh, uh, the promises are, are not going to be kept. We've seen it all over the place. Uh, and by the way, I mean, this is, again, something we see in infrastructure projects, especially rail infrastructure projects around the world. Ben Flyberg of Oxford University has led research with other European researchers where they looked at these things and they came up with a term for what happens. They call it strategic misrepresentation. And what happens is that the consultants, and by the way, I saw this as a is, member is of- Is the bullshit <laughs> translation of that lying? Uh, well, in <laughs> fact, they put that <laughs> in the academic, I was moving to that. Yeah. They put that in the academic report. Oh, I okay. saw <laughs> what happens is the consultants and the staff lowball the numbers because they know if they told the truth, You'd never get approval. And let me tell you about the Los Angeles County Transportation Commission that I served on. The price of the Long Beach light rail line, which I voted for and which passed the commission seven to four, not a big majority. There was a lot of argument about it. Was going, it turned out to be three times as expensive as what we voted on that day in 1981. Now, if we had known that that thing in 1981 dollars was going to cost 380 or 90 million dollars instead of 140, I guarantee you it never would have been approved. And that's, it's funny how every day somewhere there's a business in America who's got a project going where they, when the board voted to pursue that project, they had a cost estimate. And when the cost got out of control, they cut bait. They say, okay, right. that, we're done. We can't sink any more costs in this. And that just, it seems like the government just can't do that. Oh, you can't do that. You're uh, an elected once official. Once you approve it. Yeah, I, I mean, there wasn't. I was on the commission for four more years. We saw the pro the cost going up. I was the only citizen appointee, the only one that didn't rely on the electorate to get on the commission uh, to get into another office that would have gotten me no on the commission. <laughs> no, a public official is going to say I made a mistake and we should kill this thing. Whereas if you are working with with investors' money instead of taxpayers' money, it's exactly what you do. Yeah. Turns out that the the repeated game is different for elected officials than it is for uh, for for managers, uh, corporate managers, and, that, and that's part of the problem. Well, and that, just, that makes me think about some of the specific promises that have been broken in the current plan from the law that was passed to approve funding this project. And I mean, just, just a few that stand out. In the law, they said the fares would be $56 yep. one way between San Francisco and LA. Uh, the current plan says $88. The law doesn't allow them to do that. And they're not I mean, going to be able to do that anyway. And, so. and yeah, the 88 would be the cheapest ride on a high-speed train in the world, including China, China <laughs> where, where we know they're not even remotely trying to charge what it really costs. Um, the, another provision that I thought was really, I thought it was really a big deal at the time, though it didn't get very much attention, was that they couldn't build any of it until they had all of it they had environmental approval. In other words, they'd gone through the environmental impact report process and got an approved environmental impact plan for the whole thing. They don't have an improved environmental impact report for any of it yet, and yet they're spending the money and they're going ahead with building it. And they say outright in their current plan they're going to build the first segment without the rest of the environmental clearance. Flat out violation 
of the law. The law said two hours and 40 minutes. They've just taken that out of their plan and now the lowest time that's actually mentioned in the plan is three hours. Right. Realistically, it's a lot more like three and a half hours at best. Uh, so they're just plain violate. So the violations law, it's, I'm really curious to see. We'll find out in this case whether those kind of agreements with voters are actually binding in the state of California. Well, and the, the interesting thing is that when, when, these, uh, when these promises were made by the legislature in 2008, uh, if anyone in the legislature had said, now these promises are being made to us, the legislature, not to the people of California, uh, you can imagine the laughing that would have been occurred. But that is what exactly is being argued by the, by the, by the attorneys for the High Speed Rail Authority. Yeah, so saying, you, make, you make promises to the voters, no, the promises are really to the legislature, and they can say, hey, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> to me, it exposes you know, one of the fundamental problems with these kind of giant, I mean, in some sense, this is true of all public works projects. I mean, I think we've both seen this on much smaller scale projects. <laughs> but, but, you know, but they don't always do that. I mean, there's been lots and lots of projects that have been built relatively competently. It's not inherent, uh, it's not inevitable in the That's system. Right. It is inherent, the, the possibility for this. But the problem with this is that high speed rail is a little bit too much of a religious kind of project. I'm using that in the loosest possible sense in that there's people who are devotees of it because they love the idea, the conception. It's not a practical thing for them. It's like, this is the future. Other countries are doing it. We have to do it or else we'll just be behind and you know we can't have that in America. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, refusing to sort of confront, you know, these fundamental realities. Like, the very first time I heard about this, I thought, gee, you know, at the time I wasn't, I still won't say I'm a high-speed rail expert, I just know a lot about it. Uh, but uh, at the time I knew very little about it, but I could tell you, I know it's a function of, of, of population density and, and traveler density, and San Francisco to LA just, uh, just ain't it. But when I saw the proposal, and I, I got asked to speak up and down the Central Valley in particular, because I live up in that area, um, to like taxpayer groups, and normally very fiscally conservative uh, local governments and taxpayer groups who are saying, you know what, we support this because frankly, it's very rare that the state of California does a big giant project where they're gonna spend tens of billions of dollars, and some of that money is actually gonna get spent in our little podunk county or our little podunk town. So we're on board just because for once in our lives, we'll get a little piece of the pie. So they basically, the size and the scope of the spending of this project bought off a lot of support yeah. uh, that when these people, of course, now have buyer's remorse because <laughs> the, the price tag is quadrupled and uh, there's no guarantee it'll ever actually get built in their neck of the woods and uh, it's, it's, you know, it's looking like it was a bad deal all around when they originally supported it. Well, yeah, you look at uh, one, of the other, uh, one of the other promises in the uh, legislative bill that was put, uh, uh, that, that created the referendum in 2008 was a, was a guarantee that only certain amount of it would be built and be before there was funding put together for it. We do not have the funding we need to build okay. anywhere. We're, I think we're 40 to $45 billion short at this point. This is on a project that in 2008 was going to cost $35 billion. Now we're to $68 billion, I think it is. And we've still only got essentially 10 or 12 or something like that billion 14 dollars. 14 with the federal money. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really crazy. So, so right away we've got a real problem with the funding. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the Central Valley, uh, you, you know, the very idea that, uh, talk about a train to nowhere. This thing goes from Modesto, not, uh, is it Modesto or is it Madeira? I, I, I think it's Madeira. <laughs> Madeira. Madeira right, yeah. goes from, uh, right now all they've got the money to do is essentially Madero to Fresno. They got to get more environmental clearance to go to Bakersfield and some of them movies. To not quite say, Bakersfield. Yeah, not right. quite. <laughs> Wasco or, yeah. or Corcoran or something yeah. like that. And, and the, the idea is that, uh, uh, somehow, if, if we can't get the money beyond that, we'll turn it over to Amtrak so they can run their San Joaquin services over. That'll be the most expensive intercity rail system. Oh, my goodness. Ever, 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 yeah, but it'll be usable, at least. <laughs> yeah, they will they'll get some use out of those tracks. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's this, this, this inability to sort of turn around and confront, it's, it, it's like what you were talking about with the, the light rail, even as the costs went up, right. none of the public officials were, we're kind of in that same by now. I mean, popular opinion has changed at the time the ballot measure passed in 2008 to fund it. It was a fairly popular idea. They, uh, it won comfortably, not by a huge margin, but the majority of Californians said, we want to build this train under these terms. Uh, now, what we're partly what we're, char what we're, the reason we're involved in this lawsuit is because they're not meeting those terms. 
But separate from that, public opinion has just turned against this project. You know, the last, uh, last two or three polls that have come out have shown most people say, you know what, we need to stop until we've got a plan that will actually work. Yeah. And so far that is not, does not seem to have any impact on the politicians or the decision makers. They are driving ahead because they've got money. Uh, they're, driving, they're driving to spend this state bond money, debt money, uh, uh, even though they're violating the law in order to do so because the federal government has made quite clear, look, we gave you $3 billion. We're taking it back if you don't get something built very soon. That's the other thing is the ballot measure that, that, that California approved said the thing would be done in 2020. Yeah. Uh, you no. Know. <laughs> well, beyond that. Yeah. We'll be lucky if they've built I even that initial segment by 2020. Yeah, and beyond that, the, the federal money, I can't remember the exact date. It needs to be spent by, I think it's March of 2017. Now, with all due all respect. All spent. They have to start spending it by next year. Yeah. So that's what the so real deadline be, yeah. is. If they don't well, start that's right, spending but you've got, it by but next you've year. you got to finish <laughs> spending it. By, by, by March of 2017. Let me tell you, you don't want to ride on a train that was built in that amount of time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, and then the, we the, saw that in China, actually. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> e exactly. I mean, the, the problems that can occur. But the other thing to think about is the parts of this state that have been forgotten. I mean, we've got a metropolitan area in the south, San Diego, of three million people. We've got the in Inland Empire of about four million people. We've got the Sacramento area of two million people. All these areas were promised parts of this train. And even in 2008, when the voters approved this thing, it was reasonable for them to anticipate that this would be built in the long run. There's no way in the long run that these areas are ever going to get service uh, so that the taxes that people are going to pay to service this debt, and by the way, they're going to pay, if this thing gets built, they're going to pay the other $45 billion too. I live in Illinois. My members of Congress and some of yours in California are not going to allow $45 billion to come out of the federal government. So people in San Diego County, Sacramento County, Riverside, San Bernardino County are going to pay a, a lot of money and get no benefit for it. I mean, Cong uh, Congress actually just pulled, uh, they just yep. pulled out of uh, the, the next uh, funding request, the high-speed rail funding. So, I mean, there's right now, the federal government's not willing to spend a dime on high-speed rail. So this idea that they're going to give California alone $45 billion is, is, is pretty laughable. Well, that's the thing about it. I mean, uh, the, the, the GAO, the Government Accounting Office, uh, or Government Accountability, Accountability Office, Office yeah. <laughs> um, did a little analysis where they said, well, now, what would it take to give California all this money they need? And they compared it to the federal transit program and some other programs. And the point is, there's no way that that amount of money would be out there. I mean, we really do need to recognize in the long run, we're probably not going to spend as, as much on some of these programs as we have in the past, but California hasn't figured that out yet. Yeah, you know, just one final piece of fantasy because this really sort of <laughs> slapped me in the face. I was at a meeting in Washington where, of course, fantasy is, is a way of life, and, uh, and, and the, the advocates, uh, not, not the F California project advocates, but the high-speed rail advocates were saying, well, here's how it's going to work. You're, you're, you know, they're somewhat saying, you know, okay, some of your criticisms have some merit, but here's the deal. What's going to happen is this private company is going to build this line from out in the middle of the desert, uh, 75 miles from LA to Las Vegas. People are going to drive 75 miles and then get on a train to Vegas. And that's all going to be done with private money, <clears throat> never mind the federal loan that's going to back all of the investment. Uh, uh, Solyndra. Um, right. and, <laughs> and, uh, but, so, so then you're going to have Vegas to LA, and then they're going to build a line from that line across the desert to connect with this one in Palmdale, Lancaster. Never mind, there's no right of way through that part of the desert. I mean, that, that nobody's even conceived of that rail line. But when that happens, when you connect Vegas to LA to San Francisco, then we're rocking that high-speed rail. And so forget about all your petty concerns about the money and the ridership and the cost and violating law. All that's beside the point. When you think about that, how can you not do it? And I you say, you know what? That's when I say it's a religious fervor. I'm not sure we're... Well, We're going to convince those people with, uh, with, uh, with any kind of numbers. Yeah, and we've, we've done another report for the Reason Foundation on this Victorville to uh, Las Vegas train. And there's no place in the world where anybody drives 75 to 90 miles to get on a train or an airplane to go place that's 200 miles further, 180 <laughs> miles further. Okay, and, and now, by the way, in, in 2000, there was something called the Las Vegas monorail. And I was hired by some people in the Vegas area to evaluate the project. And I predicted that it would go 
bankrupt in, I think it was three years. And I, I apologize right now for the fact that it took eight years. Um, the fact is, it was, it, it, the, the, the consultants were way off. We have done a report for reason on Desert Express. I can't remember exactly how soon we said it will go bankrupt, but certainly within 10 years. It can't make it. It's very simple. Even the International Railway Union, which one might call the cheerleaders of the industry, says that only two lines in the world have ever been profitable. One is Osaka to Tokyo. There you have many more people than exist in any corridor anywhere in the world, and it, the population densities are huge. And the other is Paris to Lyon. Uh, and, and, and that's an amazing thing. They've done very well on that line, but nowhere else. And all of that has been government investment. You think about where there's been private investment in high-speed rail. There was the Channel Tunnel. I, I, I should say the, well, HS1 from the Channel Tunnel to, to uh, St. Pancras. Every dollar has been taken over by the government. There was the Taiwan High Speed Rail Program. They have lost two thirds of their capital at this point, and they have now had their, ex their, their franchise extended from 35 years to 99 years, hoping that they can recover. The fact is, there is no market for this that can support commercial operations. Right. Yeah, so. You know, the fundamental truth is, is that this is, a, uh, this is a, an idea that still isn't ready for prime time. And, uh, and the California one doesn't even take advantage of the strengths that High Speed Rail has. So it's really, uh, it's really I think, a fantasy project. Well, thanks, Wendell. Thank I you. appreciate uh, you, uh, you having a chat about this with me and, and with the rest of the folks on Reason TV. Thanks.